If we could tweak the volume of the instrumental just a little bit. Hey, sis, how you doing? Good to see you. Just down just a little bit. All right, all right. Praise the Lord. So as we prepare to give offering before the Lord, worshiping in our tithe and our offering, I want to remind us, this is not so much a reminder, because I believe this is the first time we've done this. We have offering envelopes and pens right here at the Made New stand here. So if you need pen, envelope, if you'd like to write a check, or even want to share cash, you can write up your envelope right there. I just have a couple of scriptures to encourage us with. Great, praise God. We got the given details on the screen. And we know that over recent weeks, this season that the Lord has brought us into, the Lord has been delivering us from this world system, all right? Israel is leaving Egypt, okay? And for a lot of us, it's been a process, okay? I speak for myself, learning how to really let go of those things that we've been taught, okay, to trust in, even uh, with, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, really an unholy dependence, okay? Because it's what our fathers did, it's what our parents did, it's what the one that came before us did, trust in the system. And so we know that the Lord has been delivering us from that. And what I want to remind us as we give tonight in our offering, um, in time is from Hebrews 11 verse 1 and verse 6 verse 1 reads now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen again what is faith It's the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen okay Verse 6 reads, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let our offering tonight be a sign of our faith. All right. Not long ago, the man of God encouraged us to ask, ask the Lord, what does your giving need to look like? What is your tithe and offering? Of course, we know what tithe is, but what is your offering? need to look like before the Lord because we know if we can hear the Lord concerning our giving we're already headed to the next level so let's be encouraged in that and if you haven't been doing it lately it's something my wife and I have really pursued the Lord and we have heard uh, glory to God what that looks like pursue him Lord what does my giving look like before you okay and so I want to encourage us in that because without that faith Without that step of faith, it will be impossible to please him. And so we know the Lord is going to give us more than enough opportunity to please him, to exercise our faith, all right, in what he has set before us. Again, the dip giving details are here. I'll just give us a couple of minutes to prepare our offer. Amen. Father, we give you praise. Lord, let these offerings be sweet smelling unto you. Lord, let they, them be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask of you, continue to work in our hearts, creating us pure hearts in giving, O oh God, in serving and honoring you. Lord, we ask of thee, look upon every seed upon every seed that it represents their households, oh God. Lord, knowing that you see our needs, that you know what we need before we even ask, oh God. And so Lord, we stretch forth. We give our offering unto you as a sign of our worship, as a sign of our allegiance unto you, oh God. Lord, knowing that you're creating in us a cheerful heart, a cheerful heart to give and to please you, oh God. Lord, all glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand in the presence of God. 
Shekara mama si i terebroso o reme si e terebroso ota. Shekara ba si ite. O saraba. Go ahead and give God praise for the word that he's prepared for you today. Come on. Be ready to receive. And let's celebrate the man of God, Prophet Moses Anderson. Awesome. Hello, everybody. God is good. All righty, all righty. Thank you, guys. And um, let's stay standing as we read the scripture of the day together. Let's stay standing. And we will be reading from Matthew 11. Okay, I'm just going to give Joshua a moment to get seated way that give me a thumbs up before I continue. James, good to see you here. It's been a minute. God is good. Alrighty. So are you there? Matthew chapter 11 verse 7. Now it looks like people actually brought their Bibles to church today. Yeah, come on now. Don't worry. We will pray over those Bibles in a moment. Yeah. And one of the things that I was seeing in my heart is that we, from this moment onwards, will begin to stand on the Word of God as we should. You see, there's something about having so much privilege. The Bible says there was nothing made that was made without the word. Come on now. And so this word of God that made everything is available to you and I. And so if that word is available to us, then that means there is nothing that we need in our lives that we cannot make by applying this same word of God. So get ready. That is the kind of expectation with which we will pray today over the Word of God, over those Bibles that are in our hands. And I'm sure that I'm not going to forget to share with you the testimony of what happened to me and the reason why I said we needed to bring those physical Bibles today. But before then, I'm just making sure that my volume is, is what it should be. If, if there's a way you can crank it up a little bit without feedback, that's going to be awesome. All righty. So Matthew 11, 7, what does it say? The Bible says, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. This is concerning who? John, John the Baptist, the one who is the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. And the people started to say concerning John, I mean, Jesus started to say concerning John. Now, it's important for us to know um, what was really going on. The disciples of John, they came to Jesus. Because you know the Bible says, and when they departed, Jesus started to talk about John. Okay? The disciples of John had come to Jesus and said to Jesus, are you aware that the one who was your forerunner, who laid his life down for you, is in prison and you're here and we're not even sure you're the one? Are you the one or should we expect another is not a question somebody asks you when they are sure. It's a question they ask you when they have doubts. And so this is what Jesus said as they were departing. He says, what did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But really, he says, but really, 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 what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. You know, I say to you, even more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. He will prepare your way before you. So, verse 11, this is where we're really going. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than than he. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let us not repay evil with evil, but Lord, teach us, continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit and help us to be in submission to that leading to overcome evil with good. As your word comes forth today, Lord, we thank you because it will do us great good. Lord, any chains that we may have come under will be broken in the mighty name of Jesus and your name will ultimately be glorified in Jesus name. Amen 
Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. God is good. So my mission tonight is in a way in four dimensions. So there are four areas that I would like for us to focus on today. Area number one is, as it is, our custom here at Communion House because we believe very much in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So we don't take lightly the ministry of remembrance, which is rather than always longing for a fresh word to make sure that we have done something about the word we have already gotten. Amen. You see, the world is always going after the next thing, the next new thing. And you and I both know that from the word of God, it, that's only an illusion because there is nothing new under the heavens. The Bible says, and this was Solomon speaking, he says there is nothing new under the heavens. He said what is, is what has been. He said what will be, is what is. So the reason why the world is always going after the next attitude, the next culture, the next style, the next fashion, is because the prince of this world, also known as Satan, wants to keep people chasing shadows. You see, the world system is like, you know, hamsters in a wheel. Always running, but never moving. Wheels spinning all the time, but no progress. I mean, look at us. Look at how many more policies we have now politically than we had 400 years ago. And 400 years ago, people behaved better simply because a lot of what guided people was the fear of God. Look at how much technology we have today. And people still struggle more. Why is that? Simply because we're told this technology is going to help you. Remember when we first started typing letters on the computer. And people were like, wow. We don't have to log around these huge typewriters. We don't have to keep looking for tipexes everywhere. You don't have to keep pushing this backspace and drawing the whatever they call that little thing. Yeah. And then your fingers don't have to be stained by ribbons. And you're like, man. All I, and I don't have to type the same document, the same letter, 50 times. Because remember back in the day, before photocopiers, you would have to type that same letter. So you walk into an office that has only one manager, but they would need 41 typists or typists or whatever they call them. And so we thought technology was going to make things easier. But look at us today. We have computers. We can send emails on our phones with attachments. And we're working for longer hours than when we did not have the technology. Is that not an illusion? When I first came to the United States of America, one of the things that blew me away completely, not in a good way, but just really shocked me, was almost everybody that I met, in fact, maybe like every other person that I met, they had never left their state. And you're like, you've never left Georgia? They're like, well, I've been to Alabama. I'm like, that doesn't count. Because I've been to Alabama too. And it's not too different from Georgia. Man, oh yeah, you have more trees and a couple more hills. So? You understand what I mean? Alabama and Georgia are so similar that when, when Delta was trying to decide where to go to, they had to toss a coin. Coca-Cola the same. Because everyone is like, Georgia, Alabama, Georgia, Alabama. We don't know. Toss a coin. And so I tell people, that does not count. And then some people are like, well, I've traveled. I've been to Pennsylvania. And I'm like, so should we applaud you now? Now, we're talking about the country that is the leader in international travel. The United States of America makes more airplanes than anybody else. We have the, big, the biggest and the busiest airports. They're here. And wouldn't you have thought that a country that is helping to advance the world in international travel, we have citizens that are well-traveled? No, because everybody's just so busy. This, these illusions rule the world. But I want to tell you this, folks. The antidote to being caught in that illusion is to recognize that God puts more premium on you remembering what he has said than on you learning something new. 
Because he that is faithful in little is the one that much will be given to. Let me say that again. Many of us are running. You see, the reason why some people are not here is because, oh, they've heard that there's a guest minister in town who has a new word. And I look at them and I'm like, yes, yeah, since the spring of 87, you have been going from conference to conference. Where are the fruits? It is just because the world continues to teach that we need to go for new and shiny things. But until we have made the most of what he has given to us, we can just forget about it. Do you know that when Jesus introduced the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus introduced the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what was the first thing he said? He said, pray the Father that he may send you another comforter. One that is of the same kind. He said, and he will bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said. So he introduced the Holy Spirit first as one that brings to your remembrance before he introduced him as the teacher. He says, it will comfort you. He will guide you. He will teach you for he knows the heart of the Father. But the premium was put on what? On remembering. Because when the ministry of remembrance is not as effective amongst us as it should be, we expend too much energy chasing shadows. This is what I tell people who come to me all the time. They're like, Brother Moses, we like the way you hear from God. Like in the moment, you can just hear what God is saying. Can we hear God like you hear God? My wife knows this. My first question is, how many times have you read the Bible cover to cover? And they're like, well, I've got this devotion that I answer the question how many times simply because the written word of God is the number one preparer if there's a word like that for the spoken word of God Jesus demonstrated that to us if anything exists that prepares you for the spoken word of God it is the written word of God when Satan came to Jesus and he said to Jesus uh, I know you're hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? What did Jesus respond with? Jesus did not just manufacture something. Now this is the same Jesus who said the things that I speak are the ones that I hear my father say. And he started by saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now what would happen or what would have happened if Jesus did not know what was written? God forbid that Satan comes and Satan himself is using the word of God to tempt you and you do not have any way of rebuttaling with something as powerful. Because Satan knows that if he just came up with his own words, it's not going to move you. It might, depending on how weak you are. But if Satan is coming after you for real, he will come with something that is powerful, that is convincing. Because he knows that there is no other power outside of the word of God that is living and powerful. So Jesus says, it is written. So I tell people, studying the word of God, reading the Bible is the number one recipe for hearing from God. Why? Because it's a way of demonstrating that you are faithful to what has been said. So if God can trust you with what has been said, then that qualifies you to, for what is being said. He said to Joshua, he says, Joshua, there's a lot of work for you to do. I have some very critical assignments for you. And he said to him, he says, but you need to know the things that I have already said to Moses. Because I don't want to be here repeating myself. I don't want to start all over again. Because for me to start all over again, I have to return you to the Red Sea. But in order for me not to return you, just bring to your remembrance all the things that have been said. So he said to him in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he says, this book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but I will meditate on it day and night that I may observe to do according to all that is written therein. I want to encourage you folks, you need to know what has been written. So the ministry of remembrance is the thing, number one, that I want to speak to us about today. And we're going to come back to that Matthew 11 in just a minute. You see, there was a time that I was so eager to know God more. I was very eager to know him more. And one of the things that 
that was stirred up in my heart was that God is love. So I came to the conclusion that if I am going to know him more, then I need to love him more. So I asked God, I said, Father, how can I love you more? Y'all know the story. I came out of my room. I had been meditating and thinking and thinking and pondering. And I came up with that solution. I'm like, this is the way that I'm going to know him more. You see, the reason why many of us don't hear God, the reason why we don't receive wisdom from God is because we don't spend enough time bothering God about the things that we have come to know are important. Because I knew that it was imperative for me to know God because I went somewhere and the man of God quoted from Daniel 11. He says, they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. I was about 18 or 19 years old. And I'm like, man, I need to do exploits. So I need to know God. So I thought about it. I pondered and pondered. And when I finally came outside of my room, I said, I think I know the key. The key is if I can love you more because you are love, I will know you more. And immediately I saw faces of people that I didn't like. And there were people that didn't like me. So I felt justified. So I started to speak in tongues. I said, Father, please remove these images. This must be the devil. I said, because I said, I want to love you more. Not these people. I mean, there's no way I'm going to love that girl. I mean, she doesn't even like my gods. So I started to explain to God the reason why that must have, must have been a, a picture from Satan. I said, God, do you not know that the last time I visited someone in their hostel, in the room that she was in, she walked me out. She was like, what are you doing here? Get out. She casted me out like a demon. And God was like, are you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. But remove the images. He said to me, he says, can you see me now? I said, no. I said, but I can hear you. He says, okay, if you cannot love those you see, he says, forget about trying to love me. And I was like, but these people, it's hard because they are in particular the people that don't like me. And so I have decided not to like them in return. I wanted to repay evil for evil because it just made me feel good. You know, when evil for evil makes you feel good, you're in the flesh, you need to repent, you need to grow. If, you're, if your spouse does a thing to you and you start making plans of how to get them back, you are not in the spirit. And the Bible says whoever sows unto the spirit will have a rewarding experience of the life of God. But if you sow in the flesh, you will have what? Destruction. And so I was, I was like, I don't feel good about this. And God said to me, I have said what I said, good luck. And so I had to devise a plan on my own of how to get to those people. You see, God is not going to plan for you. You see, that's where most of us get it wrong. We want God to draw the plan for us. The Bible says in Proverbs that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. God does not want you to come back and say, oh, I would have done better in life if not for your plan. You see what I mean? So God is like, knock yourself out. Make your own plan. And I'm going to help you break it down into steps that can result into that plan. Now someone is saying, but well, the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has, uh, you know, thoughts for me. He says, the thought that I have toward you, they are thoughts of good and not of evil. To what? To give you a future and a hope. But the original translation, what does it say? It says to bring you to an expected end. God is saying, I want to know the end that you expect. Don't just show up here without a plan. And see, that's the reason why many of us were like, nothing is happening. And God is like, exactly what do you want to happen? Or you just want to have money. To what end? What is your plan? You understand what I mean? And so we need to have a plan. And so I came up with my own plan of how I would get those people's attention. But then of course, you know how the devil works. My initial plan and the steps that I moved, made just resulted in more angst, in more frustration, in more malice. And one day after like a couple of weeks, I went to God. I will never forget. I stood outside the fellowship grounds. We had just finished an evening service. And I said to God, I said, God, I said, it's very apparent now that what you're asking for is not going to happen. I said, look, I am making all the efforts. And God asked me a simple question. He said, so are you saying that you are about to give up? And when he asked me that way, I felt so bad. Because I know that it is not Christian to give up. It is not like Christ to give up. 
I went to a church wherein the pastor taught us about 10 years, maybe six or so years before that time, he taught us a message titled, The Spirit of a Finisher. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And Jesus was a finisher. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was running out of juice, what did he do? He says, Father, I think I'm going to just shake it out and you here. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he finished his race. Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished my race. And so when God asked me, are you saying you want to give up? He's saying, are you disowning me? Because if I am God's son, then I have to be like him. So to not be like God is to disown him as a father. So when he asked me that question, I was like, you always know how to get me. I'm going to keep trying. I don't think it was quite 48 hours after that. One of the people on campus who was my arch enemy, I heard she was looking for me. I was like, that's it. It's over. Yeah, she's looking for me. I'm in trouble. And she was looking for me just to tell me, now, you know what? For some reason, I just couldn't figure out why I dislike you so much. And she said, because I don't know the reason. I guess maybe we can just get along. I was like, just about 48 hours before I completely gave up on the plan to make sure that there was love and cordiality between myself and those people that I was avoiding, those people that I was hating in return because they hate me. You know, my wife is always saying that, oh, me... Her husband, you know, finds it very easy to forgive people. It didn't come overnight. It didn't happen accidentally. I wasn't born with the ease, the grace to forgive people. I was that guy who waited for people after school to do something dangerous to them just because they answered a question that I was going to answer in class. I was that guy. And so it didn't just happen overnight. I was the same person who would say, oh, well, you want to do that? Got you. Yeah, I know where to get you. So God took me through a process of recognizing that there was no way I would move forward with him if I wasn't at peace with man. What did God do for me at that time? There's a reason why I'm telling you the story. So after having cleared the rubble and one by one, I made peace with those people. Some of them still didn't like me very much, but at least I wasn't hating them in return. Because it's important for us to have our expectations right. People will always be people. You can't change people. Ask any woman in the room. They've been trying to change their husbands since Paul went to Antioch. And the husbands are still the same. You can't change people. You can just pray for them to grow. I still snore now as I used to. You see what I mean? There's still a lot of stuff that I still do. But in a way, my wife has found a way to just continue to be gracious and to be merciful. And that is how we're supposed to be with people. People will always be people. But you need to be able to be gracious with them. And when I started to pour out grace toward other people, you know what God did? And this is the reason why you brought your Bibles to church today. He said to me, he said that I had demonstrated how much I really want to know him. Because I went the extra mile to put up with those people and to make peace. So he said to me, sit down here. So I sat down. And he showed me exactly how to make my table. It was kind of like an odd arrangement. But then I moved things around in my room because he was talking to me. I kept hearing him telling me what to do. So I made an arrangement and I'm like, okay, this kind of looks odd. He wanted me to cover some windows with some old magazines. I did all of that stuff. And after everything was covered up, I brought a board. I can't remember what I used the board for, but it was in my room. He said, now I want you to put your Bible on this board and now begin to read. Let me tell you something. It was almost as if that Bible started talking to me. I studied that Bible in that season up until one day he said to me, he says, look at your thumb. I looked at my thumb and my thumb was dry, but there was oil in my Bible. So that was why when I first heard about the oil, the Bible that was leaking oil somewhere in Georgia here, I believe it was, and people were very skeptical at the beginning. I said, well, I have had that experience. Mine was not flowing into bottles, but I had oil coming from the pages of my Bible. And from that moment onwards, the way I can describe the relationship that I had with the word of God is this. It was literally as though when I'm reading the Bible, I get into 
the book and the book gets into me. There are many of us here. God is inviting us to do the same. Inviting us to have the same experience. But he wants you to first of all clear out the rubbles that can get in the way of what he wants to do through his word. There are so many of us here that God's been waiting to reveal himself to you through the written word. But there are rubbles in the way. The rubble that was in my way was that I wanted to choose who I loved and who I didn't. And the Lord says to me, no, that's not how it is. I need you to overcome this step. Forget about all of those things because you know the reality of it is this. When we are old grudges, when we are keeping people in bondage, what we are doing is we are putting up walls to keep ourselves away from those people. And when you shut your eye for the wicked person to pass, the righteous person will pass and you will miss them too. And so God wanted me to be open. You see, if you know that there are enemies behind that wall, right, and there's no way they can get in here, you can take off your armor. But the moment that wall is breached and the enemy comes in, what do you do? Your shields go up. You secure yourself. And when your shields are up, nothing can come through. And God wanted to come through with his word and he needed me to lower my defenses. And that was the reason why he told me to make peace with people. So three things that I desire for God to do for us concerning this instruction, which I believe they are the three things that he wants to do is thing number one is God wants you to become vulnerable to him. He wants you to expose your heart to him. All of those defenses and walls that you have put up, he wants you to lower your defenses so that his word can come into you. You know what, how the Bible puts it? The Bible says, let, the Bible says, receive the word of God with meekness. Because it is able to what? To save your soul. So how do you receive the word of God? With meekness. What is the word meekness? The word meekness came from the original word that is used when a wild horse has been tamed. When a wild horse has been tamed. Who was somebody that God called meek in the Bible? Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man on earth. And we always thought that meant that he was the most gentle man. But when you read the history of the man called Moses, there was nothing gentle about him. Moses was the same guy who killed an Egyptian because of the fact that he felt like one of his brethren was getting maltreated. And after killing, he became a fugitive in Egypt and he escaped to the regions of Nineveh and he became a warlord until he became tired of fighting wars found his way to the, to, to, the, to the territory of the Midianites. And even while he was there, he was still a man that you will consider dangerous. So the reason why God called him meek was because even though he was born a fierce man and raised a warlord, he decided to put all of those things down and go to the mountain whenever God sends for him. The word meekness does not mean softness. The word meekness means to be tamed. Remember that back in the day, men who went to war, they wouldn't go to war with horses that were born in their backyard. I'm not sure if you know this thing because it took me a while to know this thing myself. But back in the day, warriors did not go, not any warrior, okay? Some, the warriors who lost battles, they went to war with any kind of horse. But serious warriors, people like David, serious warriors who won battles all the time, they didn't go to war with horses that were born in their backyard. They went to war with wild horses. So they will go in the wild and find horses there and drag them home and tame them. You know the reason why? Horses that are born in your house has never seen a rough life. They've never seen a rough life. So when you take them to battle and they see arrows flying, and they see spears, guess what they do? They throw off the horse, man. They're like, man, I'm not dying today. I didn't sign up for this. You've seen that in movies, right? How horses can throw people backwards and that's because they're not going with you. But a wild horse who has seen nothing but trouble all its life, 
when he sees the chariots coming and the other horses coming, he gets so excited. And that is why they will run and run into spears and stop and, and don't stop running until they completely bleed out. Those are the kinds of horses that people will go to battle with. And so the process of taking those horses from the wild and taming them is what is called meekness. And so when the Bible says, receive the word of God with meekness, God is saying that it doesn't matter how hard life has been. It doesn't matter how, other, how difficult other people have been. I want you to put down all of the rigidity that you have developed and all of the walls that you have put up. I want you to lower them because my word can only come through when you do. The Bible says receive the word of God with meekness. The implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. You know, I asked the Holy Spirit one day, I said, I already know what the word of God is. And so when you tell me to receive the implanted word of God with meekness, why didn't you stop there? Why did he have to say because it can save your soul? He said because many of us human beings, while we're still thinking that we will save ourselves, we will never lower our defenses. Every time you think that you have to take vengeance on your enemies, you will never lower your defenses. If you think that if you don't put up a front for people to see and know that they cannot mess with you, if you don't, if you don't know that God is the one that will save you from all your troubles, you will continue to be so full of your own strength. He said that is the reason why I put it there as a reminder. He said it's kind of like I'm helping you recognize that no matter how strong you think you are, you, are, you cannot save yourself. Many of us, the reason why the word of God is not getting into us is simply because we are too hardened because of those people who broke our hearts. You know, some of us are carrying around with us hardness of heart from your high school lover that broke your heart. And you tell yourself, no girl is ever going to do that to me again. And God is like, well, if a girl cannot even get into your heart, how will my word get into your heart? All that hardness of heart that we try to put up because we want to protect ourselves. The Holy Spirit is reminding you that only he can save you. Only God can defend you. So as long as we're carrying around, those, let me even tell you one of those other defenses that people carry out along in their hearts. Self-preservation can be a bad, bad thing. Because many of us, we have devised ways by which we live through life. Some of us went through college because of how well we can save money. And so you have developed this structure within you of how you handle money. So when you're reading in the word of God and the word of God says, and my God shall supply all your needs. You're like, yeah, through the money that I save. Jesus says, you do not add to the word of God, not a jot, not a tittle. And you do not take from it either. And so when the word of God says that if you have a feeling that someone has a thing against you, don't wait for them to come to you. Go to them. Some of us are like, hey, the last time I went to somebody, they were wrong. I knew I was right. But because I was the one who went to them, they started to remind me of my history. They're like, oh, I know you were going to come back. That's what you always do. And then because of that embarrassment, our egos are hurt. Guess what? When you're reading the word of God, He's telling you to do one thing, but you've already told yourself you will never do it that way. Guess what? That word is not going to come into you because you're not meek enough to receive it. It's okay for you to have been troubled. It's okay for you to have been born in the wild. But God is saying, I want you to be tamed so that I can ride into victory with you. You see, the secret to letting the word of God come into us is is in how much we are willing to surrender and be vulnerable and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. If this is what the word of God says, that is exactly what I am going to do. You know, I've taught you here before, about two years ago, that the secret to Samuel's hearing from God came from Eli. When Samuel was hearing his name, he didn't know where it was coming from. He didn't know what was going on. So he went to Eli because Eli was the only human being in that place. I need to say this because I know that it's the situation that many of us are in. Many of us are frust completely frustrated at not being able to hear from God very clearly even though you spend so much time in his presence. 
You spend so much time worshiping God, praying. Sometimes you play YouTube videos for hours just worshiping God. Sometimes you read the Bible for hours. You fast, you deny yourself, and still you can't hear God. And that is leaving you discouraged time after time. Do you know that it is possible to spend so much time in God's presence to be so close to the, to the presence of God and still not hear God? Can I prove that to you? Samuel. Samuel. In the temple, there were no beds. So where did he sleep? The Bible says Samuel was the guy who slept by the fire that was on the altar. <laughs> That altar represents the presence of God. And that is why there was fire. And the fire must not go out. Because they were told by Aaron that through Moses that once the fire goes out, the presence of God is out. So they kept the fire of God's presence burning all the time. That was Samuel. That was where he was. He was laying by the fire of the altar. Really close to the presence of God. And still could not decipher what God was saying. So he left where God was because God was in the fire. Just like he was in the fire when he spoke to Moses. God was in the fire and he was calling out to Samuel. And you know what Samuel did? Samuel, he went out. Thank you. You think I can use some of those things to wipe my face? There must be one of those that has like a little napkin. If you can grab me one, that will be great. Samuel heard the voice of God and he was like, where is this coming from? Someone playing tricks on me here. So he went to Eli and he said to Eli, did you call me? Because Eli was the only person there at the time. And when he asked Eli, Eli was like, I didn't call you. He went the first time, the second time. When he came the third time, Eli was beginning to suspect that, okay, this time of the night, if anyone is calling you, it's probably the voice of him who is in the Holy of Holies. So he said to Samuel, he was like, if you, when you hear that voice again, just say this, speak Lord for your servant is listening. The implication of that was this very strategic statement because Samuel knows that if God is calling to you and he wants to speak to you, he wants to know that you will do what he says because God does not waste his words. So he said to him, he says, go with the posture of a servant. If you go to God and you make a commitment and say, speak, I am listening as a servant. I will do what you say. You will hear him clearly. And when Samuel went back to the fire of the altar and he heard the voice of God, he says, speak for your servant is listening. And that changed his life forever. He became a prophet like no other. He was the one, the very first prophet to anoint a king over Israel. Let me tell you something. The life of Samuel is interesting. I mean, I'm telling you. Let's not go in there, but Samuel went to God and he said, speak for your servant is listening. I want to tell you these folks, if God knows or when God knows that you're not ready to do, he will not give you further instructions. And one of the ways, thank you so much, one of the ways by which we demonstrate to God that we're ready to do what he says, Josephine, is to do what he has already said. So rather than wait until I receive a revelation from God, a fresh insight, it is the same thing that applies to the ministry of angels. Angels are all around. They want to engage you all the time. I tell you all the time of meetings that I go in and out of. These are angelic meetings. I go to meetings wherein the Father is not there. The Holy Spirit is not there. These are just angels having conversations. And I walk in, I see their presentation, I see their engagement. And I report back to you on some of the things that I see. And that, why do they keep inviting me? Why do I stumble upon those meetings? Because they know that I honor their ministry and whatever it is they say, the part that I need to walk on, I walk on it. On the 3rd of September, I was right here. Five days before the queen passed. We were taking up the offering. It was the end of the service. And I was standing here and the angel of the Lord was standing there like right between those two cameras. And he wanted to get my attention. So he raised a placard and the placard says, this begins now or this happens now. I don't remember the exact words. And below the placard, 
all written in red was Jeremiah 22, 22. He raised it the first time. He says, this begins now. He raised it again. This happens now. Then the third time, when he raised it the third time, I was lockstep with him. I was telling Alan, I said, Alan, I said, do you know that when that engagement was going on, I was still pacing back and forth here talking about the offering. I have told you time and time again, we are multidimensional human beings. You don't have to always just be in one place at the same time doing one thing all the time. Your heavenly father is not like that. He's omnipresent. That is the reason why he's omnipotent. You are able to become extra powerful and extra able to do things when you are extra available in different places. I'm not talking about being distracted. I'm not talking about being confused. I'm talking about being intentional, about engaging various levels in the realm of the spirit. I was here pacing back and forth when the angel was showing me that. So I stood just like I did on Tuesday. Remember on Tuesday, I moved the pulpit backward and I stood because the Lord said to me that he's trying to get the attention of people in the room, but they're not paying attention. And so he says, stand and be my reference point. That was the reason why I stood. Oh, look who's here. Hey, Steffi, good to see you. All the way from Maryland. Come on now, God is good. Praise the Lord. And so here is the deal. I was engaging the Lord while I was speaking to you and the Lord said to me, you need to be there as the reference point. Because my angels are trying to remove scars on people's hearts, but they're not focusing. They're not standing still. They're so distracted. Their minds were all over the place. That was the reason why I pulled back the pulpit. You know me? I'm not the best actor in the world. I don't even like to dramatize. But I would do those things because the Lord is saying too. So how many people remember that I pulled it and I stood in front of you? Because the angels are like, I, where, the Lord said to me, let them focus on you. And then we can get their attention because of what the Lord was saying. So the same way I stood here, even though my natural self was still pacing back and forth, but in the spirit, I engaged the ministry of that angel. And let me tell you something, folks, if you have been listening to me teach for a while, you know that those nuances, I do not take them for granted. The day the Lord showed me what he showed to Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah was the one that heard when the Lord was speaking to the earth. How the angel of the Lord that carried a message from God before he delivered the message, he hadn't even brought out the scroll from inside his pouch until he knew that he, he had the earth's attention. What did he say? He says, oh earth, earth. He says, now hear the voice of the Lord. The first one was, oh, to call his attention, earth. And then the earth responded. And when it came, he called him again to identify himself. He says, earth. And the earth responded and he said, hear the voice of the Lord. The Lord showed me that experience in the realm of the spirit. And he told me, he says, this is the reason why some of y'all, I can't speak to you because I don't have your attention. Even the earth, the Lord had to grab his attention first. And the angel of the Lord knew not to speak until he had received the attention. Because if any one of those words fall to the ground, the angel will have to be accountable for it. That is the reason why, because God would only trust you with his words if you know, if he knows that you're going to follow it to the letter. I told you the story also once before of when the Lord was sending his angel to go and prepare one of his servants for, for a mission. He said to the angel, this was Noah in particular, when God sent the angel, his angel to go and tell Noah about the flood that was coming. He said to him, he says, come. He called the angel, he summoned the angel and the angel stood before God and God said to him, he says, I have a message for the son of Lamech. He said, I'm going to send that message through you. He said, but you're not going to appear like you do now because you look scary. The Lord said to the angel, he says, do not appear as you are. He says, cover yourself. Okay, because some of those angels, the Bible says that they're made of fire. They're literally walking plasma energy. And that angel was so excited about the announcement that God knew that if you go the way you look, Noah will not even be alive to listen to the message. Oh, Yes. Because we saw people in the Bible who experienced angels in their angelic form. In fact, people in the Bible who experienced human beings in their transfigured form fell to the ground as though they were dead. That was a human being that was transfigured. How much more an angel that has always been fire? I don't know if it was me. I'm not going to wait to hear what that angel has to say. You show up looking like that, you're on your own. I'll be dead even before you spoke. You see what I mean? Oh yeah, totally. Because like, why? Why would anybody do that to anybody? I told you the story of Joshua 
Joshua was busy minding his business, our son Joshua. And then my wife prayed for him after they had Bible study. And she was like, I am praying for you. And she was laying hands on them that they would see angels. And God went, I said, God, Joshua went to sleep and an angel of the Lord appeared with a burning face. Joshua appeared in our room like a log of wood. I don't know how we got there. It was almost as if his legs was not moving. He came and when he appeared in front of me, he was shaking like a water leaf. He was shaking. He was shaking. And I said, what's going on? What's going on? He said, there is something in my room. I'm like, what do you mean there's something? He said, someone appeared to me. He said, but it doesn't look friendly. All he could say was, it didn't look friendly. It didn't look friendly. And so when he was saying that, the Lord showed me what he had seen. I said, okay, tell me. He had a face like this. You could see through it. He says, yes, I could see through it. I said, it looks like he was just flaming. You could see through it. He says, I, could. I said, it was the angel of the Lord. He says, no, it couldn't have been. He said, because he didn't look friendly. They don't always look friendly. I don't know about you, but what Ezekiel saw was not friendly. He saw people walking around and they had four faces. Mark, if you suddenly open that door, you are going to use the restroom. And somebody appeared to you in four faces. And there were no four human faces. I mean, if there were four human faces, that's not a problem. I just have to say hello three more times. But one of them, one of the, yeah, one of the faces, you know, you have somebody with four faces like, hello, mister, hello, miss, hello, another mister. You know, if there were four human beings, but one face is the face of a man. The other face is the face of an ox. Another face is the face of an eagle. And then there was the fourth face that was the face of a lion. I'm not even afraid of an eagle or an ox, but the face of a lion. I'm not using that bathroom that day or maybe even ever. I will just ease myself where I'm standing. You understand what I mean? These guys don't always look friendly, but the Lord, God was sending him to Noah and he said, don't go up looking like that. He says, cover yourself. And then as soon as you show up, just in case something happens with your disguise, he says, just keep announcing as you show up that I am from the Lord. So the angel of the Lord covered himself. He probably borrowed somebody's human body and showed up in there, but he was saying, oh, just in case, I'm from the Lord. I am from the Lord. You see, but the reason why it is important for us to know these things is because God does not want somebody to abuse the message that he is sending. The people who did in the Bible, you know, let me tell you something. I'll tell you another quick story. Another story of Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah, he said, you see those prophets, I told them that I'm about to deal with my people. That I'm going to send the sword and I'm going to send famine. But those prophets were like, ah, there's no way we're going to deliver bad news. So they went to the people and told the people, everything's going to be all right. They went in the Bob Marley spirit. Every little thing is going to be all right. I'm like, how can every little thing be very all right? When three birds have come to my doorstep and they are talking to me, nothing is all right. That's why I said they came in the spirit of Bob Marley, confused. They said, everything's going to be okay. And what did God do? God said to Jeremiah, he says, they refused to deliver my message adequately. So that sword will pierce them and their families. God does not joke with his word. I tell you, the Bible says a false witness is an abomination to the Lord. I know a way to preach that will make me friends. I know a way to teach that will make me popular. But guess what? When the Lord told me, when he called me, he took me to that verse of scripture and he says, what are you reading? I said, it says that a false witness is an abomination. He said, if I haven't put it in your mouth and if I haven't shown you, you have no business saying it. You say it the way that I show it. It might not be popular, it might not be pretty, it might not be nice, but you know the consequence of not delivering. I said, oh, absolutely. You see, the deal here is God wants to entrust you with his word. But he wants to be very sure that if he's sending you to somebody that you do not like, you do not hold back the word. You know, some of us, if God sends us to those people that don't talk to us, those people that have blocked us on social media, those people that keep passing by our posts, they don't like it. The only time they like your post is if somebody is tagged in there that they like. So if God gives you a word for those people, he knows that you will not go. And that is the reason why before you get into the word of God, the way God wants to engage you through his written word, he wants to make sure that you have come with a meek heart, ready to receive. So what did I do? On Tuesday, I was here. We were taking the offering. Thank God that 
our attitude towards the offering here is such that we are worshiping the Lord with our substance. If I had come in here to raise an offering and I was so hell bent on raising money, I would have missed what the angel of the Lord was sending, telling me. Again, this was the 3rd of September, five days before the queen passed and the angel of the Lord stood there. And do you remember what I said the angel was showing me? Jeremiah 22, 22. And what did we do? We read it together. And the angel of the Lord said to me, as soon as he got my attention, he says, now you know. And I told you, we have the recording. You should go and listen to it again in case you missed it. He says, now, after he showed me the placard, he says, this is happening now. Jeremiah 22, 22. He says, now you know. Make the most of it. Do you remember that I said that? He said, make the most of it. And what did he tell us? We went to Jeremiah 22, 22, and we read. In fact, let's read it again. Let's read it again because I know some of you, it might take you almost forever to go and watch the video again. But this was five days before the queen passed, right? And what did the Lord say to us? Jeremiah is right after the book of Isaiah, and the number 22 is the same number of this year. If you know, you know. What does he say, Jeremiah 22? It says, pa Pastor Joseph, I'm happy that you're here because I want you to hear this. It says in verse 22, the wind shall eat up all your rulers and your lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then you will be ashamed and humiliated for all your wickedness. But the part that the angel was showing to me was up to that point wherein it says that your lovers shall go into captivity. He says, all your rulers. And I delivered it like the angel said to me. And the angel said to me, he says, tell the people that the leaders that will start to drop because of this wind of the Lord that is blowing. This is an east wind, I hope you know. But this is not just an east wind this time around because this is part of the wind that is blowing from the four corners of the earth. The winds from the four corners of the earth are a representation of the activities of the kings of the earth. Because you know there are four types of rulers in the world. There is Pontius Pilate, there is Herod, there is the leaders of the children of Israel, the Zionists, and there is also the leaders of the Gentiles, the ones that hypnotize. Those are the four people that the church had to deal with in Acts chapter four. And the Bible says, continually in Revelation chapter 5, all the kings of the earth. So we know who we're dealing with. So this particular wind is coming from all the four corners, being led by the east wind. He says it's coming and it will take out your rulers. And specifically, the angel of the Lord said to me, he says, these are the rulers that have held the people captive. September 3rd, what happened on the 8th of September? The queen passed. Now, I told you on the day that I was not going to mention in any names. Mention any names. But now I've got the license to do so. And guess what is significant? The word of the Lord to us on the day was this. He says, do not join those who mourn. He said, because if your love for them is greater than your love for God, you will find yourself in the house of mourning. He says, what do you do? He says, celebrate because this means that people are about to be set free. He says, now that you are free, praise the Lord. The word of the Lord, I, we were going to play that video again today, but we, had, we don't have the, we, we didn't set it up correctly, so it's not playing, but I would take the liberty to say it to you again because for me, it is not grievous and for you, it is safe. What did the Lord say after all of that? The angel of the Lord said, while he was delivering the rest of the word of God, what he showed me on the placard was to get my attention. But he had a message that was packaged differently. This was within that one or two minutes that I was taking the offering, that I had this encounter with the angel of the Lord. He says to me, the leaders are about to be blown off. Not the leaders, the rulers. He says, because they have ruled with a rod of iron and they have held the people captive. And so guess what happened? The queen passes. Interestingly for me, she passed on my mother's birthday. So when everybody was posting about the queen, I didn't have to feel left out. I posted a picture of my mom. I said, and what did I say? The angel of the Lord says, don't mourn, celebrate. I said, I celebrate my mom at 73. Because the word of the Lord says, it is time for us to celebrate. Because it is a sign to us that anyone that has held people captive is being removed. Was it not six months ago that the Lord took us of the prophecy of Jeremiah that says overthrow, overthrown, I will overthrow the ones that have been and put mine in place. 
What did I start teaching us about two months ago? I started teaching us from Psalms 82 when the Lord says that you were raised up as my children to take care of the poor and the needy, to look after the, the afflicted and the fatherless. He says, but you have completely used everything to your advantage. He said, God says, you are my children. You have lived like gods, but you will die like men. He says, and another will take your place. We have seen a change of God and it is happening right before our very eyes. Why is it important the first thing the angel said? The angel says these things are happening now. Because he wants me to know that what I'm seeing is not going to happen months from now. That, is, that we have come to the same season. Five days after it happened. Now let me tell you something. I'm telling you these things today because I woke up this morning and the Lord was saying to me that more is about to happen. And one of the people that I had sent the message to, the one who raised me in ministry, the Apostle George, I sent him a clip of that video and you know what his response was? He said what the Holy Spirit said to me. And I didn't even tell him, I just sent him the clip. And he said to me, it was like, oops, more shall follow. Now, this is what I think is the most significant part of what the angel revealed to me on the day. He says, now that you are free, see to it that you make the most of your freedom. I am telling you that a new order has come into the world. Resources that were kept from us in the same ground that God gave to all of us that some people have chosen to control for centuries, God is cutting off their fingers. We need to start to change our mindset. God did not set us here to be salary earners only always living at the mercy of another. God is saying that yours is the earth to inherit. It is all about getting our inheritance. And so when we see the kings of the earth being blown off, begin to dream and begin to position yourself to do things that you never dared to do before. Let me tell you one of the things that I have started to do. Because I am Nigerian. And there is just a couple of things that you cannot dare to do as a Nigerian because all those things are controlled from Buckingham Palace. Nigeria as a country claimed independence since the 1st of October 1960, but their independence is an illusion because they were desperate for something new and they gave it to them. But in reality, nothing's changed. But now that the Lord has said to me that the order is changing, I am beginning to position myself, myself and my household because I'm like, now we can do the things that the Lord has always put in our hearts. I am telling you, look around you. Anything that you've always wanted to do. You know, I told us on Tuesday that we need to delete the word they from our vocabulary. Because we're always saying, oh, I wish they would make that bridge. Oh, I wish they would widen 85. I wish they would do this and they would do that. What happens when the time of the Lord comes and you become the they? I know it's too wonderful. Many of us cannot even conceive of it. But how is that different from people that were born into slavery in Egypt? They never had anything to their name. Even the implement that they used, they had to check it out in the morning and check it back in at night. Because the Egyptians did not trust them enough to let them go home with something as little as a hoe. Because they can turn that into a weapon tomorrow. So these people had nothing and they slept one day and woke up and they were free men. And the Lord is saying to them, as far as your eye can see, I have given to you and to your children as a possession forever. Some of them lost their mind. No, literally, because they, there was just no way they could comprehend something as wonderful as that. So the reason why the Lord has sent me to you is to let you know that the ones that have held you captive, the wind of the Lord is blowing them out and it's time for you because you are the one that God is putting in there next. He says, you are a royal priesthood. You are the ones that he has chosen. I only say to you, study what the ones before you did. Because they also were children of God. Remember, oh, let me, let me show you because some people are looking at me like I'm reading from, uh, from Shakespeare. Let's go to Psalms 82. Don't worry, we're going to go back into studying the word of God and all that good stuff. But the Holy Spirit really impressed it upon my heart that we need to get a good understanding and grasp of that word. That entire word was two minutes and 36 seconds. Just about two and a half minutes. But we can keep unpacking it. Psalms 82. What does it say? Hold on one second. Psalms 82. 
Look at what he says. He says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. The word gods there is the word El. E-L, which means mighty. And so the ones that are mighty upon the earth, the kings and the queens, the rulers, the ones that control territories, the ones that control continents. The Bible says the Lord was judging amongst them. He says, how long will you judge unjustly? And show partiality to the wicked because they drink with you and they chase little children with you. You just let all of their all of their sins, you cover it up. You allow them to get away with pedophilia, you allow them to get away with drug dealing, you allow them to get away with a lot of things. You look the other way because they are your friends. God says, I'm watching. He says, Defend the poor. This is your assignment. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know. They do not understand. But you do. They walk about in darkness. But you have the light. It's, God says all the foundations of the earth are unstable. All of these foundations, the foundation, the pillars of our world, education, entertainment, farming, health, all of these things are shaking up because the people that God put in there, they were seeking only their ambition. And the Bible says in verse 6, I said you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And now verse 8, you know the significance of the number 8. 8 is the number of what? Of a new beginning. And what does he say in 8? He says, you know the number 10 is the number of a dominion. 8 plus 2 is 10. This is one of the ways by which the Holy Spirit taught me to remember these things because God was intentional about where he positioned things in scripture. 8 plus 2 is 10. 10 is the number of dominion. And these guys have been dominating the earth. But God is saying in verse 8, a new beginning comes. And what is, the, what is that new beginning? The new beginning says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. How does God inherit the nations? By distributing it to his children. The Bible says that we are co-heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. And the Lord is our portion in the land of the living. So basically everywhere that I go to and the name of the Lord is there is my portion. And so the Lord is about to inherit the nations once again. He's reclaiming the nations back from the principalities and the powers that have been for centuries. Because they have done such a shady job and he's going to give it to you. And you have a thousand years to run it. Are you going to do any better than the families in Europe? Are you going to do any better than the monarchs in Europe? Are you going to do any better than the capitalists in America? Are you going to do better than the communists in China? Are you going to do better? A lot of these people started well with great intentions because their families were ordered by God to bring justice upon the earth. But after a while, they became self-pleasing men and women. We have come to the precipice of another new beginning. And in order for you not to faint at the entrance of the promised land, you need to prepare your heart. You need to be ready to conceive of the fact that, wait a minute, all those people that were once working against you are now going to work for you. Simply because the extent to which the enemy has come against you is indicative of the extent to which God wants to bless you. Remember when there were three armies that came against the children of Israel. Three armies came against them. That was the biggest loot that they ever had. Because after the Lord defeated the enemy before them, guess what happened? The Bible says that after three days of collecting treasures, because a serious enemy will not come against you with clubs and with sticks. They will come against you with the Damascus, the best of steel. They will come against you with shields that are made of gold. They will come against you with the best of the metals that they have simply because they're so confident that they're going to destroy you. So they're not even bringing toys. They're bringing the real things. And God intends for them to do that. Because you know what we read two weeks ago? What did the Lord tell us? I think it was two Saturdays ago. When the Lord said that Satan, represented by Pharaoh, assessed the children of Israel and was like, <laughs> by the time they get to the other side, they'll be tired. That's when we're going to strike them. And the Lord says, when they come, they will find me. So the reason why they have come against you with everything they have got is because they think that you're hopeless. They think, you, what do you know? That you don't even know the world that you live in. That you don't even know the science that purifies your drinking water. That you don't even know how to generate electricity. If they don't give you electricity and gas and give you clean, clean water, you're doomed. If they don't make the roads, you can't leave your house. These people have become so confident 
thinking that our lives are in their hands. It was for a season, but the Lord is saying, I have come to inherit the nations and to put in place my own. So because that is the mindset with which we have been raised, let us not be like those people who would not be able to conceive of another day. So the extent to which they have come against us is the extent to which God wants to bless us. So when you think about all of the decadence that is in the world, all of the destruction, one of my favorite things about what this particular order of rulers have done, I've shared this with you before, it's not a secret. You know one of my favorite things about what they have done? They have taken continent-sized islands and entire continents and deleted them from the map so that we don't know they exist. That's one of my favorite things because right now I get to inherit land that is still virgin, that has not been polluted, that has resources, that allows for some of the dreams that I have to begin to come through. One of these days I'm going to have a special where I tell you some of the dreams that I've been having, some of the things that God's been showing me. I told Alan one day, no, not just Alan, I told Alan and the leaders who were having a prayer meeting. And I said to them, you were there, man, the leader, you remember. I said, in the millennia, God brought me to the house that we're living right now. And when I saw it, it looked like a refuse. You know what a refuse is? The place where you dump waste. What do they call them here? They just call them dumping ground, I'm guessing. Landfield. Yeah, yeah that's what it looked like. And you know why? Not because it's not beautiful, no. But the beauty of the world that is about to re be revealed will make even what we think is beautiful now to be like dung. The Bible says that when the latter glory is revealed, that which is glory now will cease to be glory. You know, you look at places like Singapore and Dubai. When you see what's coming in the millennia, that will happen through your hand and the hand of the children that God is going to give to you, those places will cease to be glory. You know, I've been saying it. And the angel of the Lord came and he says, it begins now. These superpowers are going down. But you know, what we need to be mindful of, however, because you know, I'm not just going to tell you the good part and not tell you the challenging part, is because the fact that they have been in power, they have been keeping, the little, they've been keeping a lot of the dogs in check. When the wind blows them, the dogs will bark. There will be chaos in the world for a little bit. But God is saying, don't worry about it. I'm just allowing the little animals to eat themselves off and make room for you to come and reign. So don't let it bother you. But these rulers, how many of them are going down? Do you know? Sister Barbara? Seven? Good, 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 good answer. Alan? All of them. Oh yeah. The reason why I said seven is good because seven is the number of perf perfection. Okay, so she might have been speaking prophetically, but it is all of them. Every single one of them. Let me tell you, I have seen this and I'm going to share it with you. Do you know that mostly all of the oil in the world is mostly controlled by one person? There is a principality, but it looks like a man. He is a man in human form and he likes to be worshipped. He's going down. And I'm happy to say that now because in the past when God shows me these things, they scare me. But now I'm not afraid anymore because the wind already left the north. And the moment that wind leaves the north and makes it secure to gather more zest, and now it's being led by the east wind to come, it is irreversible. These guys are going down. Before they get to me, they would have gone down. Okay, praise the Lord. This should be an exciting message because, come on, God is telling you that he's taking care of the ones that you could not defeat on your own. God is going ahead of you to take down Pharaoh. But don't worry, the Bible says with long life, he will satisfy us. We will live long enough to be able to fulfill all of what God has commanded us to do. God has an amazing strategy. Do you know that before we resume taking over, let me tell you this. This is the part that I'm, one of the other parts that I like the most is this. Before we resume our position as the next rulers of the earth, as the ones who have been given dominion, we will receive our new bodies. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. Very awesome. You know one of the things that I shared with a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, because I felt like he could handle it. I'm going to share it with you also is the fact that, you know, the queen passed at the age of 96. And what is 96? 
What, remember what I told you on Tuesday? What did I tell you on Tuesday about the coin and Methuselah? I said the person of the coin is a sign unto us like Methuselah, their longevity. The longevity was because of the mercy of God. God wanted to give people time to repent in the time of Noah. That was why he allowed Methuselah to live that long because it was one of his witnesses telling the people to repent. Remember, he was one of the people telling the people whatever to repent. And so Methuselah was one of the greatest that ever lived. He lived the oldest. And if you take 10% of his years, what is it? 96. Because he lived for 960 something years. 10% of that on average is what? 96. So I tell you that so that you know that this millennial reign is truly going to be a thousand years because God's given us a sign. But many of us in the natural now cannot live longer than the queen. But the Lord is saying we will live as long as Methuselah until our work is done. And for that, for that to happen, we're going to receive new bodies. That was what Paul saw. Paul said, I saw that the trumpets were blown. And he said, in the twinkle of an eye, we were caught up to the heavens and we were changed. And we put away mortality and we took on immortality. And what did we do? We came back with the Lord. Because you know, you know what's going to happen? Tia, let me share this with you. More like in your direction. The Bible says that we will go up. We're going to be caught up with him in the blue skies. We're going to receive our new bodies. We're going to be changed. And then we will be with the Lord. Now, this Lord that we're going to be with, what did he say? He says, I am coming back for you so that where I am, where there you shall be. Now, what would we want to know? We would want to know where he is going to be. Is he going back to heaven to be there forever and ever? No. He told us that he is coming to the earth to establish his government. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus told his disciples, he says, where the bodies are, there the eagles will gather. So the moment we get caught up in the rapture to go into the blue skies, to meet with him halfway between here and heaven, where our new bodies are prepared, I believe it's going to be like a spaceship. We're going to be in there. And when, once we're changed, who is going to be left on the earth? The ones who are without the life of Christ, the dead ones. And so he says where the bodies are, down there, you who have become eagles, whose strength is renewed. He says there we're going to gather. We're coming down and we're going to deal a blow on the wicked ones and we will establish God's reign upon the earth. Let me tell you something. Do yourself a favor. Start to think about all of the things that you suppressed when you were a child. All of those childhood dreams that you had that they killed at school and buried in the news. You need to wake them up because when Jesus comes, he will be happy to know that you are ready to take on some of this inheritance. The Lord is your portion in the land of the living and the Lord is not small. So if the Lord is your portion, man, you need to start thinking big. You need to start dreaming big. You need to start thinking. And why is all of these things important? Someone may ask. I tell you the reason why it's important is, is very simple. God has prepared you for this time. So it's important for you to cooperate with the preparation. So I'm going to take five minutes to quickly wrap up what I'm saying and then we're going to pray over the scriptures. I just thought, not even me, the Holy Spirit made it very clear to me that I needed to unpack the vision of that angel. So that you know the reason why God will send one of his angels to come and stand right there and reveal to me that these guys are about to start dropping and one of them is dropped already. If I'm more than one, the Lord is letting me know that some have dropped. It hasn't just made news just yet. Simply because of the fact that there are people around them who want to take advantage of their position to seize power. But they do not know that that power has no longer been given to them. They will try, but after a while they will come out and let us know those people have died. There are world leaders who are no more till today. Their body doubles are parading everywhere. Don't worry. There's nothing hidden that shan't be revealed. It is coming. So very quickly... I remember where I was. I was talking to us about the fact that there are three things that I would like to share with us today. I may not get to all three, but I started with number one. That for your Bible study life to take off, you need to learn how to lower your defenses so that you're receiving the word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. The demonstration of meekness toward the word of God is the ability for you to not question what is written. 
the Egyptians have an ex expression. Once it is written, it must be done. And so if it is already written in the word of God, then you must do that which is written in the word of God. The moment you begin to align yourself with what is written, then guess what? You will be qualified to receive what is being spoken. So let us examine our hearts, folks, and be ready to love the unlovable. Let's be ready to humble ourselves and put away pride. And be ready. You see, because it is only by humility that we can learn something new. If you're so prideful and you think you've known it all, there's no room for you to learn something new. And God wants to speak to people that will act on his word. Because doing God's word is what creates capacity in your heart to receive more. If the last instruction that God gave to you is buried because of the pride of your heart, guess what happens? He's not going to give you any more. Remember the story of the talents. The one that was given one talent, he was too prideful. He was like, how can you give me just one talent? When the owner of the talents came, what did he say? He said, I had always known that you were a tout. He said to the owner, he said, I've always known that you're a wicked, you're a wicked master. How can you look at me? A hold me. You give me one talent. He said, I buried your dirty talent in the ground for you. So that when you come, you can retrieve it the same way you gave it. Pride did not allow for him to receive more. But the ones who were so thankful that they were considered worthy enough for any talent at all, and they did business with it. Jesus says that to him who has, more shall be given. So to him who has the word, demonstrated by their actions, more shall be given. The key to revelation is activation. If you activate the word of God that you have read, you will receive more revelation. But why should God overlabor you with more when you have not done anything with the little? So I want you at this particular point in time, because of time, I wish I could keep going. There is a lot of stuff that I am seeing tonight. But let us bring our Bibles. Let us rise up and put forth our hands. Those Bibles, let's just put them forth. For those of you that were not here on Tuesday, as I was wrapping up the meeting, we had even done the announcements, I think the Lord said to me. He says, I want to do for them what I did for you. Let me ask you, in godly humility, how many people like the kind of revelation that God gives me from the same scripture that you have been reading. The Lord wants to do the same for you. And then he's saying, bring your physical Bibles today. Because I saw that what God did was not just walk on my heart. He did something to that Bible that I used to read because it started to produce oil. And you know the implication of it is this. That oil is the anointing. That oil is what? Is the anointing. So now for those of you who are still wondering, oh then, with all of what you have said today, why did we read Matthew 11 when we started? Matthew 11, 11. When God says, of all the children born of men, none is greater than John the Baptist. He says, none is greater than John the Baptist. You know why Jesus said that? Right? All the prophets. Jesus asked the people. He said, these John the Baptist and his disciples, let's just put them aside for now. They're just agitated. They've been in the flesh. They're, they're carnally concerned for their boss when they should be rejoicing that his work is done. You know, John was called to be a forerunner. And after the Messiah himself has been revealed, what other business or what need is there for John? John needed to be set free to go back to heaven. You understand what I mean? Because you know, John came from the side of the father. Jesus said to them, he says, this is Elijah that is to come. Even John the Baptist himself did not even know the full extent of who he was. Which is a big problem. A lot of us, if only we know who we are, we will comport ourselves differently. You know, they asked John the Baptist. They said, John, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not Elijah. But when they ask Jesus, Jesus says, if you have the heart to receive it, he says, that is Elias that is to come. If John knew that he was Elijah, he would have comported himself differently because while he was Elijah, the political order of the day in terms of who? Ahab and Jezebel, they were looking for him. And why were they looking for him? They wanted to chop off his head. When he came as John the Baptist, he was not connected consciously with the fact that he was Elijah. And that was the reason why after he fulfilled his calling, 
this time around, his mission was not to call out the political order of the day. When the angel of the Lord spoke to Zechariah, he, he said to him what was in Malachi chapter 4, that a son will be born to her who is past the age of childbearing. And this son shall be the forerunner of the Messiah. Wild locust and honey shall be his food. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and to the sons of the father. And that was exactly what was fulfilled when John was born. That was his only mission to be the forerunner. But guess what? Because he didn't know he was Elijah. He allowed that Elijah that was in him to come forth. And he started putting his mouth in political issues. Sometimes people want me to weigh in on political issues. So people don't even know whether I'm Democrat or Republican. I do that on purpose simply because I know my place. Let me say this again. We need to get this because the world wants to make us think that we're not. John the Baptist was Elijah. But this particular time that he came, he came to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was supposed to be what? The voice of him crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. He had no business telling people how to run their government. So after the Messiah was presented, Jesus said to John, he says, all you have to do now is to baptize me in this water and we would have fulfilled all righteousness. God told John, after this, you can retire. But John was like, wow, this feels good. Maybe the Holy Spirit will show up again tomorrow. He kept on doing it. Many of us will keep on after God has left and moved to something else. We build a tabernacle in that place. He tossed him his head because if he had remembered that Elijah was taking up in the chariot of fire because God did not want his head to be cut off, John the Baptist would have behaved himself. But he didn't behave himself. He kept on putting his face in political figures because when you are not doing what God is asking you to do, you will get yourself into trouble. So the moment he started making comments in the newspapers, you know that was what the Bible says. The Bible says that and men heard from John his opinion about Herod and his brother. And the fact that Herod had taken his brother's wife. And so he was publicized that John was running his mouth. That was when Jezebel recognized him. Jezebel was like for thousands of years we've been looking for this guy. He disappeared in a chariot of fire but he's back. She went to Herod. She went to her daughter and says, Oh man, I wish I could teach on this subject because the Holy Spirit broke it down to me one day the reason why it had to be the daughter. Anyway, what did she ask for? Herod was like, up to half of my kingdom I will give to you. But the spirit of Jezebel was like, I didn't spend hundreds of years coming back into this world just to inherit this dirty kingdom that you have. This kingdom that you have is about to fade away completely. Jezebel knew that because she was a principality from the past. She was like, just tell your father you want the head of John the Baptist. And I think that was the moment. I think when they were taking him to, to the guillotine was when John the Baptist realized that, oh my God, at the end of the day, I'm Elijah and I didn't even know it. So they finally got my head. They finally got his head. Go and study your Bible. You will find out that Herod came in the spirit of Ahab. Anyway. The real point here is this. Jesus said, he said, some of you said, is John a prophet? He was like, yeah. He said, but this time around, he's even greater than a prophet. And the reason why John was greater than a prophet is because all the prophets, all they handled was scriptures. The written word. But John, the beloved, saw the word of God become flesh. And that made him great. If we are going to be great in the kingdom of heaven, we need to familiarize ourselves with the written word to the point wherein we encounter the spoken word become flesh. Jesus told them it wasn't because he prophesied. It wasn't because he was born of a woman who could no longer have children. 
but it was because he was there when righteousness was being fulfilled. Not just the law and the prophets, he says, but righteousness was being fulfilled. God wants his word that became flesh to become flesh to you. But you have to fulfill all righteousness. If you're going to be great, you need to study the word. And then, like I told you, oil started to come out of my Bible. And the oil represents the anointing. What is the anointing? The anointing is a mark for a visitation. From that moment onwards, I, rec I recognized, I didn't know immediately, but I knew afterwards that it was like God came into my room and he assessed my consistency. He assessed my commitment to the written word. A lot of what I was reading up until that time, I didn't understand as fully as I should, but I kept on keeping on. Remember the Holy Spirit came in and told me to load up all the bricks? So I started reading even genealogies. But from that moment onwards, the anointing showing up on my Bible marked me for a visitation. And that's after. After that, I started to see angels. I started to have visitations. At very critical times in my life, the Lord Jesus himself will appear to me. Simply because he marked me for a visitation. Today, as you're holding the Bible in your hand, if you don't have a physical Bible, hold your phone. I believe that one way or the other today, you should not leave this place without a mark of the anointing. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Okay, let us bring all of those things here. Let us just lay them out here. The Lord says, if it's not your will, do it the way that I showed it to you. Not my will, but yours be done. Hallelujah. Let's just lay all those Bibles here. Let's lay them here. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. And this is what the Lord showed to me. I want you to just put your Bible down and then you step back. Hallelujah. And then you see what the Lord showed to me. Can you align that Bible properly? Praise the Lord. A little more. God is good. Alrighty. This is what the Lord showed to me. I was a bit reluctant to do it because I didn't understand it, but I remember that when he says it, I just do it. He showed me standing with these Bibles laid here and I raised my right leg and then I put it over one of the Bibles like this. And he said to me, because I asked, I said, what does that mean? mean? He says, it means that you are standing on the word. Now you may pick your Bibles. From this moment onwards, you will stand on the word of God. You will no longer stand on sinking sand. You will stand on the word of God. The word of God will be the foundation for all that you do. It will be the foundation for your thoughts. It will be the foundation for what you think. It will be the foundation of your plan. It will be the foundation of your responses to people. The word of God is going to be the foundation of how you receive things and how things leave you for the world. Praise the Lord. I am delighted. I am delighted, I am delighted. I am delighted, I am delighted. The Holy Spirit said to me, he says, what about verse 8? I'm going to leave you all with this one. He says, but that doesn't mean it's the last scripture I'm quoting tonight, okay? So don't take that as a promise. Because I know how y'all can be. He says in verse 8, but what did you go out to see? A man that is clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. He says, what have you come to see? Let me tell you something. When people went to John the Baptist, they did not know what to expect. Okay? Because they're like, I mean, we don't know. How can there be a prophet in the wilderness? What's going on? But hey, if that's where the Lord is, we're going to go anyway. You know what the summary of this passage is? John the Baptist was a mystery. The word of God is going to make you a mystery. And you want to be a mystery. The devil is very clever. And people can be smart. And systems can be very advanced. But the moment you become a mystery, they can no longer figure you out. They don't know where you're coming from. They don't know where you're, go where you're going. They're like, why is he eating white locust and honey? They don't know. But as a strategy, you know that when Jesus was to be born, the prophecy of Isaiah says that a child will be born of a virgin Mary and he would take, he would save his people from their sins, right? Did that happen? Was he born of a virgin? 
Did he save us from our sins? So that means everything that was said about that prophecy, prophecy, we should expect it to come to pass. The Bible prescribed what Jesus will eat. Before Jesus was born, they knew what the Messiah should be fed. They didn't feed Jesus bread and butter. They fed Jesus what prophecy prescribed. The Bible says curd, which is like cheese. You know when uh, milk is being churned? before it becomes as hard as cheese, while it's still soft, it's called a curd. The Bible says curd and honey shall be his food so that he will know to avoid evil. All of that was a mystery. Nobody could figure it out. Why is curd and honey a way to avoid evil? Because the God who made the mind knows that what you eat can have an effect on how you think. Do you know that there are certain kinds of cheeses that you will eat and you will have nightmares? You think it's a superstition? I used to think so too. Until they gave me some cheese from Greece one day, some of my Greek friends. There was almost nothing that didn't chase me in the dream. Even roaches. And I woke up and I'm like, what kind of dirty dreams are these ones? And then I was reminded that I ate that cheese, that that is just customary. So let me tell you something. You are supposed to be a mystery so that the enemy does not even know the reason why you eat what you eat, why you drink what you drink, why you pray the way you pray. Because if they can't figure you out after a while, they're just going to let you go. They're going to leave you alone. So this is how you become a mystery through the word of God. And so we're going to break bread right now and we're going to break bread with a verse of scripture from the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to read verse 14. And then we're going to skip over to, I believe, verse 19. And we're going to take those two things as legs to stand on as we break bread today. Because you know me, I, I like it when we come out of here very equipped. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Ladies and gentlemen, now listen to this. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey. Okay, I already told you that. That's why the Holy Spirit said to me, we're going to skip from verse 14 and go to 19. The Bible says, they will come. All of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rock and on all thorns and in the pastures. In the same day, the Lord, no, it's verse 17. The verse 17 says, the Lord will bring the kings of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house Days that have not come since the day of Ephraim, the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So let me just quickly say these things. I told you about the times that we're going in. That the rulers have been blown away. And the miscreants around them will make trouble. And there will be great trouble. But God is saying, you don't worry. As long as you know the sign that I have given to you which is I have allowed a virgin to give birth to a son whose name is called what? Emmanuel God with us. The Lord is saying if I am with you it doesn't matter what comes the extent to which they come after you is the extent to which you are going to be blessed. So God wants you to break bread today confident in one thing that God is with you alright God is with you but do what he says load yourself up with the word of God become a mystery when they come and they're knocking down people's houses to mark them for destruction they will not find you because you have already been marked for a visitation you're a mystery your address has been deleted from their books now I'm saying this to you and I want you to listen to me very clearly we have all known that a time is coming wherein there will be no place for men to hide from the Antichrist when he comes. But the Lord is saying, no, not these ones. These ones are mysteries. They don't even need to hide. They just will not be found. 
they won't find you. You have become what the Bible calls a mysterion, a mystery. For you to continue to be a mystery. You know, I said this before, but I don't think you all put it in perspective. So let me tell you again. This thing right here is not just words. These things are codes. The more code you have, the more difficult it becomes for the enemy to decipher you. Okay? You know they tell you when you're creating a new email that if your password is less than eight characters, even James here can hack you in two minutes from his phone. Yeah, because there are apps to do that. And that's why they say your, your password has to be long. Choose the title of a movie and then put the name of your high school in between. And just because the longer the code, the more difficult it is to decrypt. That's why God is saying, I want you to load yourself up with more codes so that when the Antichrist is finding people very easy, they will not find you. One last thing. I want to give this to you as a bonus. Revelation 7.14. You know, God's been taking us to this Revelation 7.14 a lot lately. Uh, and I'm, going to, I'm, just, I'm just going to remind you of why today. Don't worry, we may continue this thing on, on Tuesday or not, but I pray that the Lord reveals to you the two other things that I want to tell you about studying the word and the three other things that I want to tell you about the time and the seasons that we're in. Don't worry, I did not forget. We just have run out of time for today and the Bible says to cut it short in righteousness, so don't let's overdo it. But the Lord would allow for a time for, to, for you to know what, what those things are. So just know in your heart that God said he would show those things to us today. Even if the man of God hasn't gotten to it, the Holy Spirit will get to it and it will get to us. Believe, 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 believe. So verse 14 of Revelation 7. Look at what it says. He says, and I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulations and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> so, let me just quickly um, read verse 13 so that you get some context. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? John was like, sir, <laughs> you know. He's like, I don't know. And I'm not about to guess. And the elder said to him, he says, these are the ones who came through the tribulation, whose garments were washed in the blood of the lamb. Let me tell you something. This thing right here is pure gospel. You know, the Bible says that some will be saved as though by their own blood. We will go through tribulation, but the only blood we will shed is the one that has already been shed. Did you, did, did you read what we just read? Oh, let me read it to you again. I, because I know you haven't got it. When you get it, I will know. The Bible says that these are the ones, the people who know, they know. Please sit down again. Yeah, because some people have already sat down. You can sit down too because I'm not done. Let me tell you this. Ha la 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 broom la mosa. Let me tell you something. That in your case, what the devil wants, he just wants your mind. He wants your attention to be fixated on things. And the Lord is saying, put him to shame by not letting any one of those things bother you. You must show concern in your capacity as parents. But just know that there is one that is more concerned than you can ever be. The one who is their maker. So don't let the devil get your sleep. Don't let him get your attention. And make sure that he doesn't even get your money. Simply because whatever it is anybody is saying that should make you worry and run helter-skelter. Just say to yourself, the Lord has us covered. Okay, that's what he wants. He wants your attention. He wants your focus. He wants you to worry. But just know that look, the Lord is on your side. And if he is for you, no one can be against you. So just be confident. Just tell yourself that. If your thoughts are running faster than your mouth, slow down your thoughts by speeding up your confession. And say, so the Lord is for us, not against us. All these things work together for our good. And the moment you feel that peace in your heart, 
and your feet begin to shuffle in the joy of the Holy Spirit, then speak to Satan. And say to Satan, get your dirty fingers out of the mind of the ones that we love. But don't speak until you find yourself sitting in that place. You know why it's important for you to get the peace and joy before you speak? He said, the Bible says, the one who sits in the heavens laughs. So if worry and care and concern have brought you from that heavenly place where you're laughing to a place where you're crying and you're feeling heavy hearted, that means you're not sitting on your throne just yet. That authority is not as effective. Be confident in God. Go to peace. And the moment that peace becomes joy, then guess what? The moment you feel that joy coming and your feet are moving, then speak to Satan and say, Satan, get your fingers out of their minds and it's going to leave you alone. And he's going to leave them alone. And the kusa, ambo suta, lenki diom, angada. According to the time of men, in seven days, the angel of the Lord is going to visit you and take things over. You will just know. It's going to look like a phone call, but it is the angel of the Lord that is at work. Don't worry, when I told you to wait, this is the reason why I told you to wait, because the Lord was cooking something in me for you. And that is what it is. So be at peace. If I let me tell you something, don't let anybody worry because you are worried. Take it on to be the person who is dishing out joy to those around you. You understand what I mean? Praise the Lord. Because the more you give that peace, that confidence, that assurance, and that joy, the more you serve that, the more it's going to flow from within you. Can somebody please pass her the tissue? Praise the Lord. God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So here is the deal. The Bible says these are the ones who made it through the tribulation. But their garments knew no other blood but the blood of the Lamb. So when the enemy comes to draw blood, he will not find your blood because you are already washed in the blood of the Lamb. We will go through tribulation. You know some people told us that we were rapture and escape because before the tribulation comes because God is not going to make us subject to the tribulation. No, he will not allow the arrows of the enemy to touch us. But we will still be here when that tribulation is on. But our blood will not be shed. Hmm. Let's read it again. What does he say? He said, I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come. Let's read it again. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Who are the ones who came out of the great tribulation? The saints who were standing before the throne of God waiting to receive their crowns. They were standing there in white garment representing righteousness that is not by works but by the blood of the Lamb. And the other was like, do you even know who you're looking at? And John was like, I will I know. I didn't go to school. He says, sir, you know. And John, and because why, why was he asking John? Because the elder himself knew that these people are a mystery. It doesn't make sense for us to be looking at people who have made it through the tribulation. Wherein the Bible says the earth will be troubled more than it has ever been. And they're standing there and there is no smoke and they just came out of the fire. I'm, let me dwell on this. You know why I'm dwelling on this? I had a conversation with the Holy Spirit today about divine protection. And I didn't even think too much about it. It was one of those conversations that you have and I was thinking about a bunch of other things and I was having that conversation. But this is the reason why. This is the end of that conversation, okay? Or at least this is where it has gotten to. And I'm going to share it with you. We are coming to a time wherein we need divine protection. Okay? The reason why these people are important is because these people of Revelation 17, who are they? Come today, they are you and me. We are the saints that will come out victorious. But guess what? For us to be victorious, we have to be a mystery. And what is the mystery about us? That everything that will be done to us has already been done to Jesus. That is the reason why the effect of it will not be seen on us. Oh, come on, you didn't get this. When Jesus went through the fire, when he came out, did, was it obvious that he had been through the fire? Yes. Let me say that again. The Bible says Jesus, when he died on the cross, where did he go? He went deep down to hell. 
having spoiled all principalities and power, made a show of them in it. He was raised from the dead. When he was raised from the dead, the first person who saw him, saw him and he looked like a man who had been in the fire. Because when they saw him, they mistook him for a gardener because his clothes were dirty and covered in smoke. You know, the time that Jesus was raised from the dead was the time wherein the bushes were being burned by gardeners to prepare for the new planting season. So when you saw gardeners in that season, their clothing would usually be dirty and covered in smoke like they had been through the fire. When Jesus was seen, the first time they sighted him after resurrection, the Bible says he was mistaken for a gardener. His clothing, his clothing was dirty. He looked like someone who had been in the earth, who had been in the smoke, who had been in the fire. It's in your Bible, go and read it. Now my words, Jesus looked dirty when he was raised from the dead. But because he has already been through all of that, you don't have to look dirty when you come through the tribulation. Your garment is white because you were washed in his blood and not in your blood. He's already paid the price. This is the secret to divine protection in the times that we are coming into. To know that whatever it is the world wants to do to you, they've already done to Jesus. He bore the shame and he bore the pain so that you can remain stainless. So that you can remain spotless. I will go through the tribulation and I will be spotless. I will go through the tribulation and appear and I will be in white robes. Jesus was already made dirty. Do you know the Bible says that it was the plan of God that Jesus should look so uncomely that there was nothing good to see about him. His face was marred, his flesh was torn and his garment was filthy because that is everything you and I should have been like but the Lord put it on him so that you can come out of it spotless. And that is why it is important for us when we are breaking bread to break bread with utmost gratitude because Jesus paid the price. And that was why he says, I don't want you to forget me. He says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. I went through too much for you than for you to be going through it again. So why did I suffer if you also have to suffer? Rejoice in the Lord and be glad because he was bruised for your iniquity and the chastisement of your peace was placed upon him. And that is the reason why whenever the devil wants to make you sad, just tell him Jesus was sad because of me. I am not going to be sad because that would be double jeopardy. It's double jeopardy. If Jesus already paid the price and you have been made to pay for it, let us rise. As we break bread today, I want you to say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in you will I trust. I will say of the Lord, He is the glory and the lifter of my head. I will say of the Lord, He is my shield and my buckler. The arrows that were meant for me, He already took the hit. That I may be spotless. He already bled. So that I don't have to. Lord Jesus. We love you. Thank you. For all of what you took on. So that we don't have to. And this is the confidence. With which we press forward. Into the millennia. Into this glorious reign where we get to inherit the earth in the name of our heavenly father in Jesus name you may eat of the Lord's body for this is his body that was broken for us and you may drink of his blood for this is his blood that was shed for us drink to your new season eat unto new anointings in Jesus name amen Praise the Lord. God is good. So let's be seated very quickly in his presence. We're just wrapping up. The moment we take up this, um, I want you to prepare. Did we give our offerings already? Oh, that is fantastic. God is good. All righty. So because of time, I'm only just going to make one announcement. Okay? And the announcement is this. If you can be here on Tuesday, be here. In fact, at this particular point in time, it's not recommended for anybody to miss a service. Whatever has to move, let it move. God is preparing us. We might not look like a lot, but that is also part of the plan of God because we are a sign. He says, I will give to you a sign. 
We are a sign of what it means to be the remnants on the earth. You understand what I mean? So don't miss it. One of my friends messaged me today. He lives all the way in Minneapolis. And he says to me, he says, I watch the teachers. Now that is somebody who lives far away. Now if you live just in a stone mountain here, don't let anything keep you from coming. I understand Stephanie who lives in Maryland. She joins and she watches online. But if you are here, don't miss it. God is doing great things amongst us. You see, let me tell you something. You see, there are seven things that we must know as we're going into this new season. Alrighty. On Tuesday, I will not be saying them alone. This is what I've been told. And I want you to listen. Look, I'm, we don't get, we don't charge you gate fee. So don't be thinking that I'm saying this so that the money can be complete on Tuesday. No, I'm saying it because this is my mission. The perfecting of the body and the edifying of the saints. To see the men of God to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. That is the reason why I am here. So I'm encouraging you, don't miss it for anything in the world. When you come on Tuesday, my friends will be here. Praise the Lord. I can confirm that to you because on Tuesday, I have friends who are going to be here to speak to you as I speak. While I am speaking, you will hear the voice of angels because they're coming and they're going to blow the trumpet when they come. So please don't miss Tuesday. And the reason why they are coming is because these seven things are the seven things that God is saying to the church. And you know the church has seven angels. Right? The church of God. The church has seven what? Seven angels. An angel for each of the seven churches. And so the Lord is doing a work. So please do not miss Tuesday. Let us rise to our feet. Man or leader, come and pray for us. Come and pray us out. Now listen to what she's about to say. Okay, I know because the Lord said to me, he has put a word in her mouth. No pressure. Okay, do we have to carry you? Okay, all right, because I, I wasn't sure if the steps are still there. Let's just celebrate her as she comes forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. What a word. What a word. Praise the Lord. Um, so, yes. A lot of confirmation, so Lord, thank you. Um, can we turn to Psalms 34 and then we're going to pray. And Psalms 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. My soul shall uh, make boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This was something that the Lord gave me uh, just right leaving out, leaving out the house to come to service. So as Pastor Moses was uh, preaching and, and, and telling us everything that the Lord has been sharing with him, let us continuously bless the Lord at all times, no matter what, where we find ourselves, we have to bless him and then let's do it together. It says, let's do it together. Let's bless the Lord. So let's just pray right now. Father God, we thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you for the unveiling. We thank you, Lord God, for what you are doing in this hour, Lord God. We thank you for the ears that are being opening right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, God. Your mercy and your grace that is leading us through, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for this word, oh God. We thank you for this this house, oh God. We thank you for this platform, oh God. Hallelujah. We praise your name, oh God. We thank you for each and every one that is here now, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that you 
are coming to show up for your children, oh God. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord God, that you have put a word in our mouth, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we are to see it come forth, oh God. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. That visitations will happen, oh God. That encounters will happen, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. That you are revealing yourselves to us in a mighty way, Lord God. We thank you that we are a mystery. Hallelujah. That we will be a mystery in this season. Father, we thank you. We give you praise, oh God. Be with us. We go in peace, hallelujah. We go in joy, hallelujah. We go in righteousness, hallelujah, in Jesus' mighty name. And we give a shout unto the Lord, hallelujah. Yeah.